I want my community to hold me accountable. I want to be pointed out every time I act and it's not in accordance with yogic values because that's how I believe I'll grow as a human being. Thanks for tuning in, Dharma Talk community, and welcome back to episode 009. We haven't even hit double digits yet, and we've reached a pretty significant milestone for me personally as a podcast host. This is the first episode where I'm interviewing someone who I've never met before in person, and the podcast itself actually opened up this connection for me, so that is pretty cool. But enough about me. Let's hear about today's guest because she's a big one. I'm talking to Kino McGregor living legend in the Ashtanga yoga community and beyond. She's also the co-founder of Ohm Stars, a yoga education platform online, and the Miami Life Center, her studio in Miami Beach. She's a prolific author, and more recently, she's been at the center of the media, at least in the yoga world, for her stance in a pretty um, complicated and delicate controversy around aloe yoga and Kodiap and another teacher named Dana Falsetti. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, then this interview will definitely catch you up to speed with current events. But I also want this podcast to be timeless because who knows when you're listening to this. So we do cover some timeless topics like battling internal resistance and giving yourself permission to share your knowledge. We talk about the power of community to affect change. And we talk about general yogic principles and how we can use them to grow not only as businesses, but as people. So we'll get into all of that just after a few announcements. Hey yogis, I just wanted to let you know that I've recently started recording some of the master classes and workshops that I'm teaching around the country and around the globe. And I'm putting them online on my website and they're totally free for you to access. Now I know it's not the same experience as coming and taking class in person, but I know that's not possible for everyone. So I wanted to make this an option available no matter where you are. Now, all you have to do to get access to my audio library is head on over to henrywins.com slash practice. That's henrywins.com slash practice. And there'll be a little box where you can drop your name and email address to get access to that page. So go check that out. I appreciate you taking a look and please enjoy. Yoga teachers, if you're not building your email list, you're doing yourself a huge disservice. Look, followers are great, but Instagram and YouTube, those things are all rented space. And if the companies that control them change the algorithm or pull out the rug from under you, your ability to communicate with your students en masse could vanish just like that. And that's why email is the most important tool in your tool belt for communicating with your audience. The platform that I use is called ConvertKit, and I've chosen it after testing out a lot of the alternatives because I think the user interface is intuitive, it's easy to use, and it's simple to design automations. If I'm triggering your technophobia right now, don't worry. That's just a way for you to spend less time on the computer so you can spend more time teaching and doing what you love. I use email and ConvertKit whenever I want to get in front of you guys about new podcast episodes, new online classes on my website, or a workshop coming up, or even to learn more about what you guys need. And ConvertKit has paid for itself many times over in private lessons, workshop attendees, and other opportunities that have come my way through email. So here's my offer to you. I want to give you a 14-day free trial of ConvertKit, no risk, no strings attached. And you can sign up for that at henrywins.com slash ck. And when you sign up through that link, I'll also give you as a bonus my three-pronged list building strategy. And for the first 10 people who sign up after this episode airs, I'll also give you a 20-minute call with me over Skype to help set up your account. Sign up for your free 14-day trial of ConvertKit at henrywins.com slash ck. What's your purpose? What's your vision? What mark will you leave on this planet long after you're gone? I'm Henry Winslow, and you're listening to Dharma Talk, the only podcast where I interview inspirational yogis on how they're changing the world in their own unique ways. Whether you're still searching for your purpose or already walking the path, I hope these stories get you excited to live your dharma. 
Hello, Dharma Talk community. Welcome back to another episode. And do I have a treat for you? The guest today is a big one. And although this woman really needs no introduction, I'm going to take a shot at one anyway. <laughs> Kino McGregor was one of the youngest women ever to be certified to teach Ashtanga Yoga under Sri K. Patabi Joyce. And since then, she's inspired countless people worldwide to take up a personal yoga practice. She's the founder of Om Stars, the world's first dedicated yoga TV network, co-founder of Miami Life Center, a traditional Ashtanga yoga center, which she runs with her husband, Tim Feldman, in Miami Beach, and the author of several books, all of which aim to make yoga practice and a yogic lifestyle accessible to all. As you can see, Kino keeps very busy. So, Kino, thank you so much for taking the time this afternoon and coming on the show. You're so welcome. And thank you for that wonderful, warm, welcoming introduction. I am super happy to be on this podcast and to have a little chat about yoga with you. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Okay, let's just jump right into it then. Uh, okay. I always ask my guests the same first question, and that's this. What does the word dharma mean to you? And what is your dharma as you understand it today? Well, there's a, many ways to sort of look at that, look at the concept of dharma. But when I think about it, I always think back to this one moment in my life when I was I, w I think I was 22 or 23 years old and I had just started doing yoga and I remember um, sitting with, um, you know, a bunch of people and they were all people who were a little bit older than I was and many people had, you know, jobs and, and, they, and, and they were doing great things in the world The people were running charities and foundations and just doing these awesome things and I was just there sort of as a lost student. And, and then they, you know, the conversation turned to me and I just remember everyone saying, well, what about you? What are you going to do with your life? And I just felt, you know, lost. And I, I still remember that feeling of, of feeling, you know, utterly helpless and feeling like I really wanted to add something valuable to the world, but I didn't know what it was. And I, I remember my answer. I, um, I, I said, I said, I want to find the one thing that I've been put here on this earth to do. And then I want to do it with all my heart. But I remember not knowing what it was then, but I had this feeling of that I, I have been sent here for a mission and I want to enact that mission, whatever it is, with all my heart. So I've come to understand Dharma as your mission, like your life mission. And I, I genuinely believe that every single one of us has been sent here for for a reason that we've been that. And, and then that and that reason is very is very little to do with our material possessions. But that reason is always about our spiritual learning or our contribution to the spiritual evolution of humanity as a whole, however big or small that contribution may be. I, I believe that we're each sent here with a mission and that and then that mission is our dharma. And there's this calling in our souls to fulfill our dharma and 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 what and find out what that what that unique mission is that we've been sent here on this earth to do and, and how we're going to contribute to the 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 evolution the spiritual evolution of, of humanity and and how we're going to do our small part to to make the world a better place to shine a little bit more light into the world yeah what's interesting to me from your answer is and this certainly resonates with me is the first step of following your dharma is just to feel called to have one or to identify it in the first place and that can certainly be a challenge but mm. at this point i think you you know you you've become a very successful person your name carries a lot of weight it's basically house held in the yoga community at this point so i think i have a sense but why don't you tell us what is your dharma as you understand it today well i see myself as um, a torchbearer, you could say, someone that shines light on the path for others. And I, I consider myself very blessed to have been passed on some of the sacred teachings of yoga. And I feel like my mission, more than anything else, is to shine light on the sacred spiritual path of yoga. And while this has definitely led me to be, you know, in the spotlight here or there, or be you know, acclaimed as the author of a book or founder of a company or something like that. I, I really genuinely believe that it has very little to do with me. And I kind of see myself as a bridge that people cross over on their own realization to the deepest truth that's available through the practice of yoga. Cool. So 
let's take it back to your personal experience then a little bit, because, Mm -hmm. you know, as you said, the service and the Dharma really is about everyone else. But what does your personal yoga practice look like these days? And how has that supported you on your path? First of all, without my without my yoga practice, I wouldn't m- without my yoga practice, I wouldn't have I wouldn't be on this path because for me, you know, my practice is really the foundation. I think of myself first and foremost as a student of yoga, and then it's from my foundation of daily committed practice that everything else stems forth from. I I've been I feel like I'm here today speaking to you because for over 20 years I've made the decision to get on my mat six days a week. And I've been committed to this, to the discipline of Ashtanga yoga for that long. For yoga has been in my life for even longer. And then within that period, I've I've probably been coming to a daily meditation practice for about 18 years. And this is the those two tools have led me into deep personal healing, as well as into um, the deep personal resolution and reconciliation of you know, emotional knots and emotional blockages and has led me to really live in, in a place of peace, a place of harmony and really a place of love. I can definitely uh, agree with you that the yoga practice has the ability and it's a proven track record of getting me through some difficult times. So that makes perfect sense to me. I want to hear more about when you made the decision or when there was a decision that came to you, I'm not sure which it was, that you needed to take a step into teaching or sharing this out and bringing it away from just a personal practice into something that you are bringing to others, and as you said, become a torchbearer. So mm-hmm. when was it that your dharma clicked and when did you realize this was your personal duty? I think that there are definitely stages. Um, the first time that I was ever asked to teach was when I'd come back from India after I spent two months studying um, with Sri K. Patabi Joyce and Arshra Joyce at the Institute in Mysore. And I came back and just everywhere that I went, people came up to me and started conversations with me and just said, you know, and would say things like, there's something different about you. You know, um, I, I was working as a freelance journalist and I thought that I, I very much didn't identify, did not identify as someone who would ever be a yoga teacher because all going to India really showed me was how much further I had to walk on the path. You know, I was surrounded by people that had been practicing for 20 or 30 years. I met Patavi Joyce who had been, you know, teaching for something like three times my age at that time. And I was just, you know, feeling really humbled by the practice and just honored to be able to receive the practice. So, so I would, you know, do an interview with someone. And then at the end of the interview, they would say something to me like, Hey, you're different. What do you do? Are you really a journalist? And I was like, no, I'm in school. I was like, well, what kind of, what are you in school for? Well, I'm in graduate school. Well, is there something else though? You seem like different. And I said, well, you know, I just got back from India and I studied with this yoga master and I just started talking to people about my experience. And then through talking about my experience, the conversation would almost always end with, wow, that sounds really interesting. Would you teach me what you learned? And my answer was, no, I'm not qualified, but here's a list of all these amazing teachers you can go to. And what started happening was that people would take, they wouldn't take that for an answer. So I would meet, you know, I would say to people, really, I'm not qualified. And then they would say, well, please, I really just, you know, I just want to, I just want to. I just want to learn whatever it is that you've learned. Um, And so I started teaching um, and I said, I said, the only way that I would do it is if you don't pay me. So no payment. And, you know, maybe, you know, if you want to bring me smoothie or something, that's fine. (laughs) And so I just started teaching what I, you know, what I'd been taught um, with no payment. And then that's pretty much what I did all the way until I went back to Mysore for the second time. And I would actually say that I didn't, uh, even though I had gotten invitations to teach and I, you know, taught classes here and there, I was primarily saving money to go back to India. It was really when, after my third trip to India, I was there for six months and I, you, you know, I, was, uh, I, I, I decided after my first trip that I wanted to do these long six month trips to India and just immerse myself and get steeped in the knowledge. And after my after on my third trip to India, Guruji gave me the the sort of first level authorization to teach, and it was then that I decided to 
you know, make a website and really identify as, you know, yoga teacher. So it took me a long time, you know, from teaching my first class, you could say, to identifying as a yoga teacher and saying, okay, yes, I want to, this is what I want to do. Did you feel like you had um, permission at that point once Guruji gave you the, the certification? Oh, absolutely. I think up until that point, I was a little bit like, you know, I, you know, because in Ashtanga, we don't have this 200 hour training course or 500 hour, thousand hour training course. You know, I mean, now it's Sharat's making things a little bit more formalized, but back then it was just sort of keep going. And when Guruji thinks you're ready to teach, he'll tell you. And it was, it's very much that teacher student relationship where you don't really want, like, you don't want to do anything that's against your teacher's wishes. So if you're teach if you receive this knowledge from your teacher and then you go and teach without his blessing, that's, you know, that's essentially disregarding uh, the teacher student relationship from uh-huh. which you received so much. So I definitely didn't feel like I was, was um, wanted to really own that I was the teacher until I, until I felt like I had the stamp of approval from my teacher. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. It's sort of a, feels like a violation of trust or something. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, um, I had a sort of a similar path in the sense that, you know, I didn't go off to India. I still haven't been to India, which is something that, you know, I'm embarrassed almost to admit I really want to go. But, um, I started teaching before I had done a certification too, and I really resisted it as well because I felt like, oh, I can't call myself a teacher because someone hasn't, you know, given me the stamp of approval. And when I did eventually do a training, it did. It, I felt that permission, and it really allowed me to spread my wings and and kind of take ownership over what I was doing. So, um, if anyone else is in the same position, listening along. It's great to have your personal practice and and teach from your heart, but finding a teacher is so important. And a teacher who can teach you how to teach is just, yeah, can't say enough about that. Absolutely, you know, and and not everybody needs to go to India, you know, India, it's, it, and 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 it's not like just going to a country means you're going to find you know a wealth of information. It's about I I definitely think within the in the yoga community there are master level teachers, you know, in all disciplines, and you can find them in different places in the world. So I think I, I really commend you for putting in the work and building a relationship with the teacher that could really kind of take you on and, 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 you know, really, it really sh- share the jewels of the lineage. So that's, that's really awesome. I, 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 I sincerely hope that, um, you know, as a yoga community internationally, that we embrace the tradition of a teacher student relationship. And we really honor um, people that have devoted their lives to the practice, you know, people that have been, um, you know, teachers, seniors to me, you know, that have been uh, put everything on the line for the practice and immerse themselves not only in, you know, physical asana, but also, you know, the more esoteric or contemplative sciences and the, you know, the, the even the higher level study of of the yoga philosophy and the philosophy behind the spiritual journey. And I, I, I sincerely hope that we as a community can lift up these highly esteemed masters and really place them at the forefront of our, you know, our, our, our attention and our attentiveness. You mentioned the contemplative sciences. And um, first of all, I like that language. That's pretty cool. Um, but second of all, I think that those are the areas, those, those last three limbs in the Ashtanga system are where things get to be very powerful and practical in your life outside of the mat. You know, the yamas and yamas, of course, are, you know, mm-hmm. principles to live by as well. But I want to hear from you now about a time when you've hit a wall living your dharma. And I, I know that you've been at the forefront of the media lately. You're welcome to talk about any of those things or something else that people may not know about you. But a time where you face some resistance, whether it was mm-hmm. internal or external, and then tell us what you did to get through it. I feel like every time that I've had sort of a major breakthrough in my dharma and the activity of teaching, I have always first been been sort of filled with a desire to make it happen and at the same time a feeling of utter failure. 
And I can think of actually three instances where, and there are many more, and I, I, I seem to go through this process of, um, so when I was first starting to teach, I remember, I remember that I just said yes to everything. I was, you know, if people would offer me a class in a gym, great, I'll take it. A class in a spa, great, I'll take it. You know, be on the Sublicity Yoga Studio, great, I'll take it. Do a private, but drive an hour for it, great, no problem. And so I just like took all these classes, but you know, my classes were not that popular, <laughs> you know, so there were other people, I guess, you know, that they'd been, they'd been cultivating a sense of community longer. And so then they had, they had just many more people. And I just remember thinking like, you know, how, where are the people going to come from and how's it going to work out? And, and I remember that the, even though I was saying yes to everything, there were a lot of places, a lot of, you know, a, a lot of studios and, and, gyms and spas and whatnot that I had put my name in to be a teacher and you know people were not calling me back you know it wasn't it really wasn't like oh you're a hot commodity let's come and you know hire you it was really very much like you know really working hard to get my foot in the door and I just remember having this breakdown I'd, I'd moved back in with my parents and I was trying to save money to go back to India again and I just remember having this breakdown and I, I started crying and I was just thinking like is it ever going to happen for me you know, am I, is it ever going to work? Like no one's coming to class, you know, what, what, what is happening with this? And then, you know, you, I, you cry it out, you pick yourself back up, you, you know, you just keep going. And then I, I it was, but, I, and then I, and then a couple of days later, I, I got these callbacks and then suddenly someone had left one of the classes at the gym and it was a really popular time slot. So the class had a, you know, a good like 30, 40 people. And suddenly I had like some classes and, and, we'll, and then the, and then the same thing happened for me when I was trying to develop my online channel, I had this idea to develop an online channel. I had pitched it to um, companies that I'd worked with in the past, such as the Cody app. And they had all turned me down for various reasons. And I saw new online channels popping up all around. And I just thought, oh, no, like the time has passed. I'm never going to be able to do this. This was placed in my heart and it's not going to happen. I started to cry. And then, you know, um, from, you know, from those from those tears, I the next day I or the next couple of days, I got a few sort of open doors about website teams that could potentially develop it with me. And then, you know, one thing led to another. And here I am probably, you know, almost two years out from that moment where I just totally lost it uh, to the, fru you know, the, the total fruition of my dream. And in, and in the recent sort of very public struggles between uh, 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 regarding the the lawsuit waged against Dana Falsetti, the, the 24 year old yoga teacher and voice for marginalized communities um, by the billion dollar corporation Allo Yoga. There was a moment when um, I had just been completely overwhelmed, um, you know, and I just felt exhausted and I felt like the voice of one crying alone in the wilderness and nobody listening. And I had received so many personal attacks and threats and, you know, the degree to which Aloe and Cody had come after me personally and attacked my reputation and spread and continue to spread even to this day false uh, statements about me. And I just felt like no one's listening. You know, this is a really important issue. And I just felt totally overwhelmed. And I cried and I meditated through the tears. And I thought I was going to get on Instagram to talk to everyone on Instagram. And I ended up crying for like 40 minutes to an hour on Instagram, just about this feeling of exhaustion. And I just, you know, I, I, I never thought it would, it would, it would take as long as it did with them. Um, or cost as much as it did in, in I guess, in, in, in so many ways, you know, I, I, I still, I still had an, a, an idealized sort of happy ending in my mind that I thought would be, um, you know, relatively easy once uh, the yoga community spoke, but uh, which it unfortunately didn't happen um, in it, it, it yeah, it, it, although, although, although that issue is somewhat starting to get relieved because Alan Cody have dropped the lawsuit against Dana. It's definitely not the idealized happy ending for all teachers involved. You know, they still have their issues with me, which we can talk about a little bit later. But the lesson really, I think of this stuckness, because I, I gave those three different stories. And the lesson for me was really that I reached a point where I had exhausted all my efforts. So if you take it back to the yoga uh, philosophy, I had done my abhyasa, I had done my practice, my effort, and I didn't get anywhere. And I put my heart and soul into it. Everything I had, I laid it on the line. And the result was nothing, like no, no result. There was just stuckness. 
And so then I, and, and for me, the crying in each of these, in each of these moments is a moment of surrender, vairagya. So I release my, my desire or attachment to a particular result. I realize it's out of my control. I just turn it over because I'm too exhausted to carry on. And then from the point of exhaustion and the point of surrender, what I feel like has happened each time is it was a channel for really for God's grace to come in and, and move some mountains that I could have never moved by myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you for wrapping that up and and such a a nice little takeaway for everyone. Um, The one takeaway that I I took away as well from those three stories was this uh, the idea of community, you know, um, Mm -hmm. Sangha. Because, Mm -hmm. yes, God's grace works in so many different ways. I think in those instances, once you had surrendered, the the saving grace that came through was the rallying of support from a Mm -hmm. larger community. And even going back to the example of the teacher who says yes to every opportunity, when you say yes to everything, every time, every each, each one of those little yeses is a no to all the other opportunities around you. And you really need to be selective. And yeah. as a teacher, I think it's important to build up a core group of people who relate to you. Absolutely. Because that relationship is important. And of course, you know, you were receiving attack thoughts on Instagram as someone with a major following, they're always going to be um, haters, especially if mm-hmm. you're doing something polarizing. But I know that you also had a lot of support too. And that, that must have Absolutely. empowered you in those dark moments. Absolutely. And I'm so, so grateful to everyone who took the time to voice their concerns to Allo and Cody and to support Dana and really to stand up for transparency and honesty and integrity. And I kind of feel like for me, this whole thing has has been about defining values as a yoga community, because, you know, if we, the yogis of the world, not the businesses, the teachers who um, market their products towards us and to us as students, if we don't hold them accountable to live, act, and do business in accordance with yogic values, then the yoga community is you know, no better than any other community. But the founding principle of yoga is to be better, to make the world a better place, to, to, to follow moral and ethical guidelines. So when you have any corporation or any teacher really that's acting out of alignment with core yogic values, I think it's the responsibility of the community to hold those teachers accountable. I submit myself to that. Will I, will I, you know, pass with flying colors on every moment? Absolutely not. I'm not a saint. I'm not Jesus Christ. You know, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm a teacher and a student and I want my community to hold me accountable. I want to be pointed out every time I act and it's not in accordance with yogic values because that's how I believe I'll grow as a human being. And that's what I really had hoped that the yoga community would provide this check to the, you know, the monopoly of aloe yoga's sort of, you know, capitalization and buying up of, you know, the Instagram world and their strict control of the message and all of that sort of stuff. I'd, I'd really hoped that the collective voice of really their customers would provide a check and that they would have dropped the lawsuit against Dana and have offered every teacher who didn't want to be a part of their channel, um, you know, a, a fair and easy out that was my ideal ending. And unfortunately that did not happen. That was a little bit too Hollywood Cinderella movie mm-hmm. version. Um, you know, so the, the one piece of that that happened is they did the, as Dana posted recently and, you know, on her Instagram, she and Allo and Cody have reached an amicable parting settlement. Um, I, so it was a settlement, but I don't, I don't, I think that means that they did not drop the lawsuit. They settled the lawsuit which is uh, uh-huh. sort of a, 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 a small point, but a worthy one, because I, I, if they, you know, they, they had every right at any moment to just drop the lawsuit. I had hoped that they would have done that, you know, the blog was on Friday. I hoped Monday morning that they would have issued this public statement. You know, um, it, you know we apologize for deleting all these comments and trying to silence the voice of our customers, and we apologize for suing Dana Falsetti, we realized we chose litigation over communication and we are so sorry. It was a mistake. We hope that you'll forgive us. We also realize that there are many teachers that don't want to be a part of our channel. We wish them no harm. We don't want to keep anyone. 
you know, under, under their will. So here's a one-time opportunity. If you're a teacher on Cody, now's your one chance to just gently bow out. We'll happily take your content down and we're dropping the lawsuit against Dana. And, you know, we're going to give away a bunch of clothes to all of the, the people on Instagram or some, mm-hmm. you know, some, I was really hoping for some like feel good, rah, rah, happy Hollywood ending. Um, but that, it kind of turned into a little bit of a nightmare. (laughs) Well, perhaps it's not over yet. It's not over yet. And that's really, you know, that's really the thing. Like they've dropped the law. They've, they've settled the lawsuit with Dana, but unfortunately I uh, am, am still in limbo with them, you know? So as it stands right now, I have no settlement terms with them. They have done, they have moved uh, zero in terms of settling my dispute with them. And the facts of the matter are that, uh, since December of last year, the Cody app um, and Allo Yoga are in breach of my contract because of they, they. It says in my contract that they won't change unilaterally change my payment terms. And as of December, they changed the payment terms, and I've been trying to resolve this dispute with them, um, but they are just totally non-responsive. And I have no idea if they're going to turn around and sue me. Um, they and their actors and their paid spokespeople are going around and saying things like they know 100% that I conspired to take them down and they're spreading all these other false and really quite malicious statements about me. So I don't know what their intention is with me. Like I kind of, I, you know, I'm every day I wake up and I'm like, you know, is Aloe Yoga going to sue me for speaking out about, you know, the Dana Falsetti lawsuit? I genuinely don't know. Mm hmm. Yeah, I have to say, I have seen a little bit of that out there in the in the internet world. Um, so what what would you say to someone who, you know, because I've seen this written out there, who's challenging you and mm-hmm. saying that you've only come out against Aloe and in support of Dana because you have a competitive product now with OMSTARS also offering yeah. online yoga education. Well, I, I, I talk, it's a valid point, you know, you could, you could write off my whole, um, you know, grievance with them to a business, a business move. But truly for me, that line in the sand was drawn when they sued Dana and I definitely had skin in the game, uh, meaning sure. that I definitely benefited and wanted to get my videos taken down or buy my content back. And that's a negotiation that had been in place previously, um, the, the line in the sand for me was then, was when they, uh, initiated this lawsuit against Dana and they just, you know, over numerous, they refused numerous efforts upon her, on her behalf. So she tried to settle with them again and again and again and again and again, and they just turned them all down and they only sort of accelerated their legal tactics. So for me, that was like the line in the sand. And I said this to yeah. Waylon, I said this to some other people, if it was really just me, I probably wouldn't have spoken out about it. You know, um, I would just be kind of, you know, unhappily negotiating with them and, you know, duking it out behind the scenes. But the line in the sand for me was that they were they were they were issuing this slap lawsuit. So these slap lawsuits are are usually um, uh, it's a term that's kind of come up in our contemporary culture where a very large corporation will uh, file a lawsuit against a very powerful voice of dissent not with the intention of actually winning the lawsuit, but merely uh, trying to bury that voice of dissent under a mountain of legal fees. Ultimately, sure. ultimately, their goal is to extract a non-disparagement agreement or clause and silence that voice of dissent by either bankrupting them and or forcing them into some closed deal settlement you know, where they're not allowed to talk about anything. And, and then that's that. So that's, I felt like what was going on was this slap lawsuit. And I didn't, you know, then, then basically everyone in the yoga community started to be very afraid to say anything about aloe. Oh my God. Well, you know, we can't, compl- we can't say that, you know, we didn't like something about aloe or they might sue us. Like they're suing Dana. Oh, we can't ever, Oh, you know, I, maybe I want a refund for my Cody plan, but I don't want to say anything because aloe bought them and maybe aloe is going to sue me. So people, there was starting to be this culture of fear mm-hmm. around saying anything critical around aloe or Cody so it started to be bigger than my own personal issues. Yeah. The the one thing that, you know, I keep coming back to is this idea of community because 
that has been the one thing. And, it, you know, people give Instagram, especially in the yoga world, a lot of flack for being so visual and, and rewarding aesthetics over deeper, m- more esoteric, in your words, you know, aspects of mm-hmm. the yoga practice. But it's been a very powerful tool for developing this community. And in a David and Goliath story like this, you would expect mm-hmm. the 24-year-old yoga teacher to be totally helpless. But mm-hmm. it's I know this isn't the, the Cinderella Hollywood ending that you had hoped for, but even the fact that... Um, the litigation was settled is I think a huge win. Absolutely. And I think we should all just take a moment and really everybody who's been um, vocal in this issue, we should all just take a moment and just give a huge thanks for that. Like, thank you God for that. You know, thank you, Allo. Thank you, Cody. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, everyone. We should take a moment and congratulate ourselves for um, being brave enough to speak out and being brave enough to hold up the torch of truth and just be so thankful and so appreciative because, you know, this could have bankrupted Dana. It could have ruined her career, her life, um, and consumed, you know, her for the next, the next years. And, 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 you know, um, and that's not happening now. So I think we, I think you're very right. We all do need to take a moment and just kind of long exhale, you know, validate that, you know, in many ways, the huge fight is over. Um, you know, I have faith that, that somehow I'll come to resolution with them. I, I wish they would have done it as a global deal. But again, mm-hmm. you know, if someone brings you a basket of mangoes, you want to sort of appreciate that and not say, hey, where are my avocados? You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, OK, let's I want to give you one more opportunity to share another story um, mm-hmm. to end on a very positive note. And can you take us to a major win that's reaffirmed your conviction in yourself and the impact that you're making with your dharma? What happened and what did you do with that success to carry it forward? Oh, gosh. I I can share something that was very recent for me. Um, you know, I think that the decision to teach yoga is very much a decision of the heart. And it's something where... You You've experienced um, transformation uh, in yourself, and you want to share that with others. And I think in the beginning, you know, um, every little every little moment that you share with the student is a victory. You know, I, I remember from the very first time that I was teaching. You know, the first time you help a student do a headstand, and then they come down, and it's like their world changed for a moment because they were up in a headstand. And and I feel like it's those moments with the students that are the real victories. And whether I meet someone, um, you know, who comes up to me and says that, and this happened recently in, you know, in light of, of everything that just happened, I, I, on a day that I was feeling really exhausted and feeling like, wow, I don't know about this battle. You know, I'm just getting called crazy names and there are all these lies being spread about me. And, you know, why did I do this? You know, and, and I, I went to the grocery store and I'm minding my own business and I'm, you know, picking up, Uh, oranges I was specifically picking up oranges right then and contemplating whether I wanted grapes I like fruit a lot um (laughs) and and um you know then a woman came up to me and she just said are you Kino and I was like yes I am it's Miami I have no idea I could have gone to high school with her I have no idea you know and um usually remember high school people but but um uh and then and and she just said to me I just want you to have been following everything uh that's going on between you know you and Dana Cody and Aloe and I just want to tell you that you know, regardless of what happens, this whole situation has opened my eyes up to, uh, you know, to the to, to how much I had been sort of brainwashed. And she said that she'd just done her teacher training and a couple of months ago, and she said that when she finished her teacher training, she wanted to feel like a professional yoga teacher. And because she'd followed all these sort of professional yogis on Instagram, who she didn't realize were sponsored and paid to wear the aloe clothes, she said that she, she actually said, well, I... I just went on and bought all these aloe yoga clothes because I thought that's what you needed to wear as a professional yogi. And I really realized over the last three days that she said, the wool's been pulled off of my eyes. It's not about the clothes. It's about how I show up in class. It has nothing to do with what I wear. I can wear freaking pajamas, but I have to make that connection with the student. And, and, and then she said, and so I've really recommitted myself to being a student and, you know, I hope they do the right thing, but my world's been changed. And I, I think, and then, and then the, the second thing that, that, that sort of happened recently was I was, I was talking to a student after class and, you know, this topic came up again and I just, and I just shared this moment of intimacy 
Um, and you know, this, this student almost started crying immediately because she'd been, um, in a, in she, as a pedestrian, she was hit by a car and she, it was her first yoga class back and she came to my class after her car accident or she'd been hit by a car and she was, you know, confronted with all the changes in her body and all the healing and how, you know, how, how much she'd lost and also how much she'd healed. And we, you know, we, we, we cried together, we hugged, we talked about, you know, her healing journey. And I felt like, I feel like that moment, those moments of intimacy where there's a little seed of faith, a little seed of healing that's planted when there's an awakening that you see you've been somehow instrumental and that I've seen I've been somehow instrumental in someone's awakening, whether it's a new perspective like this, like the, the young teacher that I met in the supermarket or a spark of healing with the student that I met after she was recovering from a car accident. When I see that, those are the victories. Those are the things that matter. Um, I feel like all of the other stuff, you know, if that's not there, if we don't treasure those moments of deep intimacy and deep connection, then, um, you know, the practice starts to get a little hollow for me. So, so I count those as, I count those as victories. And I, and I can say, um, with immense gratitude for all of my students that I've been, I've had the, the, the honor, the blessing and the privilege to share countless moments like that throughout the last two decades of my life. As a teacher, that, that is everything. What a blessing. Mm-hmm. Kino, apart from getting your message out on this podcast, what are you doing today to live your dharma? Well, I am teaching a free class uh, here in Miami. That's just the kind of support for the local community. It's a one-hour class in um, the design district of Miami, and it's just a way to um, introduce new people to the practice. And... I, um, you know, I'm busy planning uh, new content and new videos for my online channel, Ohm Stars. I just had a conversation with an amazing teacher, someone that I think of very much as, you know, senior to me in, um, you know, the lineage of yoga. And he's someone that's never made a video. Very few people know about him. And I was just talking cool. to him about, about, you know, building out a course for us and a teacher development course for us. And you know, um, and, and so I'm, I'm constantly working on, you know, on that message. I have a very big idea that I can't say anything about right now because I'm working on it, but I can say that, um, there have a new, a new and very big idea that's, that's definitely been inspired by the sense of community and the sense of connection that I've been tapped into over the last month in relation to the protests of the Dana Falsetti lawsuit. And I am very inspired to turn this moment into a movement. And all I can say is I'll be more about that soon. That sounds very exciting. And uh, <laughs> I look forward to checking out that, um, that teacher that you mentioned. I don't know if you yeah. can share that person's name, but yeah, no, it's, his name is John Campbell and um, okay. he's just a, 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 a truly amazing gifted Ashtanga yoga teacher. And he's devoted his life, not only to the physical practice, but into the, into the contemplative science and the higher and sciences and higher education. I, I think that he's, he's, he's either lectured or graduated from, or maybe both at Columbia university and, you know, is just um, so deeply steeped in the knowledge traditions of yoga. So we are, truly honored to be, you know, to, to be, um, uh, talking with him about featuring him on Omstars. He's, I don't even know if John has a social media account. <laughs> what a thought. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's nuts. <laughs> well, I think this episode actually will go live before the end of the month. So do you want to share, I think you have a campaign, um, a special promotion yes. running for Omstars? Yeah, so I guess two things. Um, we do have um, a, 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 some, a special deal to celebrate our anniversary um, on Ohm Stars, and I think that you can get your first year or first month for one dollar with uh, the code all capitals celebrate one, um, and that's and that's valid until the end of the month. If you happen to be watching the replay of the podcast and it's not the end of the month. Kino Yoga, all capital letters, can get you, um, uh, I think, the same offer. Um, So two options if you're not 
you know, depending on when you hear. But what I would really like everyone to do is we are on OMSARS, we do monthly challenges for charity. So the first of every month we launched a, we launched a challenge and it's a free yoga challenge. So you don't need to sign up for OMSARS or anything. You just need to sign up for the challenge. And then every person who signs up for the challenge, we work with different sponsors and sometimes we sponsor ourselves. And, um, and, and then, and then for every person who signs up for the challenge, we, uh, uh, through our sponsors are able to arrange a charitable donation. Um, and so, the uh, charity that we're focusing on in the month of May is called Animal Hope and Wellness, and they rescue dogs and cats from the dog and cat slaughterhouses of uh, primarily in Asia, and then they adopt the pets out here in the U.S., and they're also working legally in the United States to get a bill passed to make the consumption and production of dog and cat meat illegal in the United States, which I was shocked to learn that it is actually not illegal to Me eat too. or to, 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 you know, to eat your dogs and cats or to produce or, or to produce meat from them. So it is actually not illegal. And they're working on that. Of course, our political system has its, uh, you know, benefits and disadvantages. And so they're working very hard on that to get that bill uh, worked through all the different chambers of Congress and all the committees and the subcommittees and the who knows what. So they're really hard at work on that. If you, uh, their Instagram is Animal Hope and Wellness, and the challenge is about arm balances, and uh, the, you know, it, the info is on my Instagram, and it'll be on OMSARS, and there's a landing page that you can sign up for the challenge, and it's a really amazing, amazing mission, amazing charity. I think that it really combines two of my greatest loves in the world. You get to practice yoga and save puppies. I don't think there could be anything more um, feel good than that. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I'll link up to all of those, um, all those websites and resources in the show notes. Awesome. Super. Uh, the, the last way, the or the last thing that we do to wrap up all of these podcast episodes is something that I like to call the prana round. Mm. And in this section, I'm gonna ask you six questions, rapid fire, okay. and each one I'd like you to answer in as little as one word and at most one sentence. Okay. Does that sound good? You ready to go? Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Let's do it. In one word, why do you practice yoga? God. What's your favorite yoga pose and why? Handstand because it has been my hardest and most difficult journey. What's the single best cue or general piece of advice that you've ever received from a yoga teacher? From do your practice, think about God. Do your practice. Think about God. Okay. Recommend mm -hmm. one book, modern or ancient, for our audience. Hmm. Apart from yours, of course, which we'll all link in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. There are so many. That's a difficult one. My goodness. Um, you know, for the all around, uh, all around knowledge of yoga, the deeper dimension of yoga by George Feuerstein. Okay. Is yoga for everyone? Absolutely. Okay, last question. How can our audience get in touch with you? And you've mentioned some of these already, but how can we support you in your dharma? Um, get practice. Get on your mat every day and practice, practice, practice. Every time you practice, you take care of the spiritual journey of yoga. You can always find me online. I love to see people commenting. I love to see people in class, so come to class. Also, practice with me online if you like. But more than anything, the, 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 the thing that yoga really needs from you is just for you to keep practicing all right kino it's been such a pleasure such a privilege to have you on dharma talk i can't thank you enough for coming on the podcast today um so thank you you're welcome thanks so much for having me if you got something out of this episode if you like dharma talk and want to keep it going please do me a huge favor and subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. I know it's not the most convenient thing to do, but it makes all the difference in getting the show out there and more visible to other people who can benefit from it. And hey, if you've got feedback or ideas or you want to get in touch with me, you can do that on Instagram at Henry Wins. Otherwise, I'll talk to you next week. And until then, keep living your dharma.